we are excited to bring on our next guest. We have uh, somebody that I think most of you will recognize oh. if you've been in the implant industry world for, for any amount of time. Dr. Isfahan Urban, welcome. We're welcome glad to, to the have show. you here. Glad to have you here. And um, we have, uh, we've been talking to some, uh, to some other folks that, that have a little bit of overlap with some of the things you talk about. But we're really excited to hear what you're excited about in the world of grafting augmentation. Um, talk a little bit about who you are, where you, where you are, what you teach. So for those of you who maybe are not as familiar, talk a little bit about yourself there and wh where you are. So first of all, I'm very excited about defects. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good to hear. Good to hear. And um, yeah, I'm Istvan Urban. I uh, live in Budapest, Hungary. And um, I was trained over there, partially, partially here at UCLA and Loma Linda University. And I'm focusing on uh, bone, gra bone and soft tissue grafting on, of advanced defects, such as vertical defects, uh, horizontal defects, mostly, uh, you know, posterior mandibular and anterior maxillary, but also edentulous patients and all kinds of patients who have big defects. Yeah, very good. Awesome. And I, I think where we want to begin is maybe with one of the the biggest challenges that we face in augmentation, which is the posterior mandible, or at least for many people, that has been historically a big challenge. But is it a big challenge today? You know, what is possible with the posterior mandible today as far as augmentation vertically? Uh, and what are some of the, the techniques or materials that are new or that are, that are what, what we should be thinking about or looking at today? So <clears throat> there's two things with the posterior mandible. One, that it has been considered to be very technique sensitive because of the, the anatomy and the location. The other one is that um, the mandible is, a, is really cortical, is a poor host mm. to receive a bone graft. Now, I think the technical challenge is solved. So honestly, to me, is one of the easiest area, if not the easiest area to treat. Mm. The posterior maxilla and the posterior mandible. I mean, posterior maxilla may be even easier. Posterior mandible is easy because you can manage the lingual and the buccal flap in a way that for sure you're going to be able to close easily, the, whatever the size of the defect is. I mean, seriously, if it's a, a centimeter of a defect, you can close it because you have two flaps. <laughs> now, you have to be um, aware that, you know, the more the more resort is more cortical. Hmm. And, um, and so uh, that's challenging, obviously. So one thing is that, you know, do you need to decorticalize? Like, mm -hmm. do you need to put holes into the bone? And, uh, yeah, according to research, you know, we don't know. But I, in experience, you better be. Mm. <laughs> because mm. you want to get some blood from somewhere. And also, um, you know, you, we still need to use some, some of the autogenous chips into these bone grafts. And uh, otherwise, we don't get enough, you know, growth factors and cells to form the bone. Because, again, it's a poor host. Mm. So autogenous is still important in this area yeah. and, and you feel, now what is, uh, you, when you talk about growth factors and we start hearing about what biologics are doing to mm -hmm. aid us in these, do you, where do you, what is the role of that, say in the posterior mandible in the area where we know it is a poor host? So, uh, number one, we're using particulated bone grafts and it's not a hundred percent autogenous bone, it's half of it autogenous, the other half is a growth, is a, is a, a biomaterial that is helping to stabilize the bone. And in terms of biologics, um, like the bone morphogenic protein, we are, we're doing a research on bone morphogenic protein to use uh, in a very low dose. And we tested what happens if you put it in the middle of the bone graft. Mm -hmm. If you do it in the middle of the bone graft, it looks like it's not a very good place for the BMP2 because the BMP2 is really relying on the mesenchymal cells. And there's a lot more mesenchymal cells in the soft tissues. So today we call it the lasagna. <laughs> and we do a bone graft and then we apply just a little dose, a small dose of, uh, of uh, BMP2 in the, in the collagen you know, fleece that will uh, be under a membrane that has some holes. And we put the soft tissue on the top and that is going to help the bone formation. It's going to be more rapid. It's going to be better. And just for you to, to know, I mean, what is a low dose? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's still... You still don't know, but like an extraction socket dose should be enough for in, an entire mandible. Mm -hmm. So it's very low dose. It's pretty low dose. Now we heard mm -hmm. Dr. Bach Lee yesterday uh, come on and, and, and a colleague, and he talked about uh, BMP and how it's eliminated 
um, going to the Iliac Crest. Do you feel the same way? Uh, you mean eliminated for like the need the for need that. for going to the for Iliac, Iliac, Iliac Crest? Crest. Yes. Yeah, I mean. We don't go for the Iliac Crest for the last 20 years, so that right. has been eliminated without the BMP2, I think. Right. <laughs> Even without the BMP2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You, can, you can harvest enough bone if you particulate it. Because mm-hmm. if you particulate bone graft, the, bo- the particulated bone is much more volume than mm-hmm. a piece of block. Mm. So, uh, and then you can mix it, so you don't need 100%. So you particulate it, you don't need 100%, and then the oral cavity is enough for 99% of your mm. cases. Mm-hmm. I would say, I'm not saying 100%, because... Sure. It's never 100, but it's Nothing's very 100. close. Okay. And we okay. have very big defects that you look at, like, okay, how, how are you going to take the bone from? Where are you going to take the bone from? And you can take enough bone. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So you feel that, again, that area that, that, again, historically, for many people, they've considered to be a challenging area, really, because you have two flaps, the ability to advance two flaps for primary closure. That's the key. That's yeah. why you don't see yeah. that as being... No. A challenge. It's more the technique of understanding yeah. how to properly dissect yeah. and release those flaps. Is understand that- the anatomy, mm-hmm. the different zones that you have in the mandible, on the lingual, mm-hmm. and then do the different steps according to the anatomical zones. And, the, and we are very lucky because there is very dense connective tissue inside mm-hmm. the mandible that is basically hosting the, the vessels and the, the nerves. And I like to say that this was planted here by nature millions of years ago to protect this anatomy from the dentist. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So you so you have to work hard to harm it. You have to, as long as yeah, you understand yeah. the anatomy. I mean, you really want it, you really have you really need to I mean want to harm it. It's like <laughs> <laughs> So with the advent of being able to enhance the bone, I think the next thing that we're really learning is and it's it's almost paramount now is the advancement in what we know about soft tissue. And enhancing the soft tissue uh, in the peri implant area uh, to a certain thickness. And most of these atrophic mandibles that we're working with, these are these, you know, elderly patients, maybe sometimes not elderly, maybe it's an accident or someone that lost their teeth at an early age yeah. and now we're in the mid 40s. That's right, mm-hmm. peri implantitis. Mm-hmm. And we have an atrophic situation where, you know, we, we have thinner tissue, right? One to two millimeters above right. the bone. And so how are we enhancing the soft tissue once the bone graft um, has healed or do we do it at the same time or is there multiple surgeries involved? So very good question. Now, basically, if the tissue is very thin, which happens a lot, that doesn't really worry me for the bone graft because I'm going to advance the two flaps and we're going to suture them in two layers. So it, the, 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 over, you know, the two layers is always like at least four or five millimeters thick. But then, you know, it just flattens out, and sometimes, yes, it's very thin. So if it's thin, you're going to lose bone easily because the tissue is too thin. And there is also mucosal tissue. So there's two problems mm-hmm. sometimes. Mm-hmm. The thickness <coughs> and the mucosal tissue. And Not the type. Thick. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So thickness, you can basically, you can make it thicker. You can place your implant a little bit deeper. Mm-hmm. And then you're basically guiding bone remodeling and then at the same time increasing, you know, a little bit of soft tissue thickness. You can put to a, a connective tissue graph. What we do... I don't like to take a connective tissue graph for the posterior mandible, honestly. Mm-hmm. Uh, for thickening, we use like a, a thick collagen mm-hmm. uh, matrix, mm-hmm. which is mm-hmm. thickening. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's cross-linked, so you really have to close it. Mm-hmm. And you can do that at the implant placement. Mm-hmm. But then if you do that, you, you close again. Mm-hmm. And then keratinized tissue is also a problem because if you really want to have somewhere keratinized tissue that's in the mandible, especially in the lingua. So if the patient, many times these patients, they come without any keratinized tissue. Right. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to have to graft that too. So that's already a couple of surgeries. Mm-hmm. Yes. So do you feel, knowing that you've said that the posterior mandible really, again, one of the easier areas because of the ability to have the multiple flaps, is the anterior maxilla the challenge? Is that the, is that the biggest challenge? Because it sounds like that's what Bach Lee, of course, would say too, that that seems to be if there's a place that we, we run into more trouble, it can be there. Is that, is that how you feel as well? The anterior maxilla is the one that you have to really make a decision way before you start the surgery. <clears throat> hmm. So we, we have a cl- an own classification system, which is based on how deep is the vestibule and how flexible is the tissue. The deeper the vestibule, the more tissue you have to close, number one. Number two, many of these, many of these patients, they already had multiple surgeries. So there is a lot of scarring and unflexibility of the tissue. Sure. And you have to be prepared for this. So if I have a patient who has like a big, big defect, mm-hmm. there's no vestibule because the defect is so big, 
but the patient never had surgery, then it's much easier than a patient who had multiple surgeries. So, for example, you have different tools for an extensive defect where there's no vestibule. We do an extensive flap. We call it the extended safety flap. Mm. And then we're planning even to shift tissue, lateralize tissue from the distal areas, call it the popular shift. Then where there is no, no vestibule, you may have to um, borrow some tissue from the inner portion of the, you know, basically the inner portion of the lip. And we call the uh, suborbicularis preparation. Mm -hmm. And if it's scar tissue, then you have to do the periosteoplasty too. Mm. <laughs> and that makes, for me, my favorite area mm. is the anterior maxilla. Plus, you want to ma make sure that there's like zero bone loss forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. yeah. And then you want to have good looking tissue. You want to have um, a popular in between. You know, yes. Implants, for example. You want to have a good vestibule at the end. Mm -hmm. You want to have nice looking keratinized. It's not like you're going to throw in a free gingival graft. Sure. Because that, the free gingival graft ages much worse than us. Right. <laughs> right. So in 10 years, it's aging like 25, mm. I think. And it's just getting uglier and uglier. So, for example, we are collecting mini strip grafts from the fascia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're planting them, just a thin strip. And then we have a collagen matrix to absorb that. And then we, we, we looked at in a study that we asked the patients, okay, if you had a palatinal soft tissue graft or a buccal soft tissue graft, how does it look to you? Mm -hmm. Satisfaction was both, with both cases, very, very high. But objective, I mean, we saw it's much, much nicer looking, but the patients too. So um, these are the little things. Hmm. What's the role of tunnel type of techniques compared to, you know, open flap? Because there's been a lot of, obviously, there are, there are many techniques that are available to us. Um, how many times are you opening full flap or, or split thickness versus tunnel techniques? Well, I, you know, why would you do a tunnel technique? That's the question. Mm -hmm. but they, mm -hmm. would, they do, but tunnel, the tunnel technique, the flap, is not less traumatic. Mm. Okay? Because you really don't have all the control. The tunnel technique they have done mostly to make sure that it's easier to get to keep the closure mm -hmm. on top of the, mm -hmm. the wall graph, <clears throat> and which is absolutely not a problem for us. So we do zero tunnels mm. Mm. because we just control the whole thing, and then you can close an open flap in a way that's not going to open up. So unless you want to do a tunnel to just do, do a, want a tunnel, <laughs> <laughs> right? Then, just because then, then it's fine. But to do a tunnel. To prevent an exposure of a bone graft, I don't think it need to be any tunnel. Hmm. So, for instance, I think then what that comes down to is the training of the surgeon, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And actually closure. I mean, the finishing of these cases, yeah. really it comes down to the suturing techniques, you know, the, the minuscule things that really make it, make it. Because when one of these opens up, it's not a good day. Right. right. It's, not. it's not a good day. And I think that one of the, the things that I think is missing is finishing surgery. Yeah. Where, where are people learning, right? If we have surgeons that are practicing a very high level and uh, you're practicing a very high level, where are we learning and going postgraduate, mm -hmm. right? Postdoctorally, once <clears throat> we receive our maybe specialty degree or whatever it might be, where are we going to learn some of these techniques so that we can enhance our patient care? So, you know, there are a lot of I mean, a couple of places where, where uh, very experienced surgeons are giving courses. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to, you know, advocate our courses, but um, we also do that. So, and we're very busy. Because, as you said, the first, I, would, I always say the first five minutes and the last ten minutes are mm. the two most important. That's why you fail. Right. First five minutes, wrong flap design and wrong flap elevation. Last ten minutes, not a good closure. Right. And so, um, obviously, you have to have a good training. And if you have a specialty training, like I had, um, I think I had very good training at UCLA and Loma Linda universities, where they really were focusing on, like, UCLA is perfect for, you know, how you manage a flap. Mm. But again, so let's say you've, you're an experienced clinician already, but you want to learn this, and you have to go somewhere where it's, this is how you specialize. Mm -hmm. right. For example, me, if I place an implant to native bone, I feel like I'm wasting my time. Like, right. what do I do here? <laughs> yeah. And, I, and I, I'm de I, I want to delegate, but the patient doesn't sure. want, to go, want to go somewhere else. Right, right. It's too patient. easy. It's just too easy. Right. But uh, so, yeah, so we do, um, 
Last year I did 91 life surgeries. Mm. Mm. <laughs> because all, I mean, all these courses, we do so many life surgeries. Mm -hmm. Not only to, sh to explain, to do a hands-on, but also when you show how you work. Right. I think that's very important. Mm. Right. right. And it's a real life, you know, and, and I'm not worried if it's a difficult case and it's difficult for me and it's not perfect, mm -hmm. you know, and I put that screw in like or pin in two times because I failed the first time. I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about um, materials. So what are the role? What's today the role as far as particulates for xenograft, allograft, autograft? You mentioned uh, that you use a 50% typically autograft, allograft. Is that universal through uh, most of the cases that you do, the similar uh, makeup of the grafting material? Is there a yeah. xenograft role today? I do xenograft mm. because of the stability. Because mm. allograft, and it's good, but allograft and autogenous together, they both can resorb. And what we see sometimes on the CT scan, it was because you used to do a lot of autogenous bone, that you look at the CT scan and you're surprised, like, there's barely enough. Or sometimes you see two, three, four threads completely out. Mm which is like a 20-year-old all autogenous. Now you look at the, um, a, 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 like this hybrid bone graft, you look at the CT scan, like it's like the implant is shouting that please remove some bone, I cannot breathe. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a big difference. Mm -hmm. And that's, that, that's the reason. Mm -hmm. Is there a concern around implants with xenograft as far as having foreign body type of reactions in the soft tissue? No. No, no, no. it's just not I mean, an they, issue. They're... The stability is what, yeah. you, is what you're seeing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. So I think the thing that really, you know, we were talking to Dr. Bockley about, and I'd like to hear you talk about this, is temporization, mm -hmm. right, with these cases. Yeah. And um, talk a little bit about what you're doing and who you're working with, if you're doing them yourself, and how you're setting your patients up for success. Because we know that temporization is a big question yes. that a lot of people <clears throat> really you know, have regarding these big defects. Especially cases. anterior maxilla, yes, in you the know. Anterior maxilla. When we may be going through two or three or four surgeries. Yeah, right. You need to have very good provisionals. And right. I mean, I used to do it myself. Not anymore. So there is two types of patients. One, let's say I have an anterior maxilla defect, perfect teeth. Then you don't want to make a bridge. Then uh, up to, I mean, four teeth is, is easy. Five is already a little bit challenging. So we do something called like the temporary package. I do a surgery, then I'm not going to... We prefabricate them, usually a Maryland bridge, and like a snap-on smile, an Essex. Mm. And we're going to use this Essex for the first three weeks mm -hmm. until everything settles back, because we, we don't want to destroy the Maryland. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to do a good Maryland, you know, metal, right. yes. reinforced, that, that can be done, and then, you know, just remove it a couple of times. Uh, but if the patient has... <clears throat> and we have patients when they have like... You know, usually car accidents, bicycle accidents, uh, but they're young patients mm. and they're miserable. They're coming with missing like seven teeth. Mm. They have a snap, they have an Essex, mm -hmm. cannot do anything else. Right. Yes. But they're happy because, you know, after three weeks, you did the bone graft, their lip, their face is already looking much better. Because yes. the anterior maxilla is another problem, is the lip support missing. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and when you're fixing it, I mean, the patients are already. There's far away, you didn't even do an implant, they're already smiling. Right, just with the Essex, right? And I think that's just a good combination. Essex. John, one of the things yep. that I've incorporated in my practice is elimination of the, the prosthetics that are tissue-bearing, right? right? And that, that destroys grafting. And yeah. the idea that doing the Essex first, you know, get the blood out of the field, don't worry about bonding today, exactly. super easy to deliver, <clears throat> patient's confidence and satisfaction goes up, they start feeling better. The swelling goes down. You bring them back a couple of weeks later. You've got to check on this incision line opening possibility right, right anyway. anyway. And then you're bonding a Maryland bridge in. And mm -hmm. with the technology we have today and being able to make those digitally, yeah. um, it's fantastic. Yeah. Let's yeah. talk about suture material, mm. right? There are so many out there and available. Good um, question. We know that uh, we've, we've seen people advocate different types do you have a, a go-to that you use for every surgery or does it really vary depending on what you're going for? So, uh, yeah, I'm a little bit conservative. <laughs> I was trained with the PTFE suture. Mm. The PTFE suture is super clean and strong. You don't really need strong because you, you supposedly advance the flap that you don't really need strong strength. But there's still a couple of patients when the tissue is struggling to open up. And for those, it's very good to have a, a, a good... 
you know, strong suture. Uh, we do a deep mattress suture. The mattress suture is deep in the tissue. You really better want to have something really clean. So that is the reason we still today, I've never did a bone graft in the last 20 plus years now without PTFE. Mm. Then the vertical incisions, we close with uh, six or seven zero nylon sutures. Any internal suturing, we use monofilament resolvables. That's like a Europe, little bit like a European way. When I went back and I had like, I ordered a chromic gut, they were like, well, mm. which century are you living in? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I think it's a good suture, but still, and then right. they gave me like monocryl and glycolon and mm -hmm. so. Uh, it's just quite simple. We don't really use any braided suture, mm -hmm. but you know, my friends, some of my friends, they use like seven or braided sutures for vertical uh, incisions. I think it's just the, the monofilament makes it easy. Mm. And the PTFE makes it very predictable mm -hmm. for the closure. Are you involved in any research right now that you're excited about? Yes. Yeah, let's talk about that. <laughs> so we do a preclinical and clinical research. The preclinical research, I'm very excited about that we're doing this research, for example, on the BMP. Mm. And so first we did research to see if you uh, have a membrane, hose or not hose, what happens if you put BMP in there. And we found, okay, the soft tissue is more important than we, what we thought. Then we looked at um, if you do holes or not holes in a membrane, what happens with vascularization and bone maturation? And we found periosteum is helping with that too. Then we did like a full mesh. Mm -hmm. And we found uh, it's not very good because it's very difficult to remove, for example. And it's not, we also have seen in the... Um, the preclinical research that the ad adaptation is better if you do at least one part as a membrane. Mm. And if the adaptation is better, the soft tissue doesn't grow underneath. And then uh, uh, now we're studying the, the microdose of BMP. Mm. Okay. So uh, in the la later study, we, we use the biomaterials only, BMP2 only, but like less than 100 micrograms and only eight weeks of healing. Hmm. Mm. And it was like, so when we, when we did the study design, we did it with, with, um, with Dr. Ulf Wickersher, who's very knowledgeable in this. And he was like, said, you don't need more. I'm like, and I'm like, uh, yeah, it's a very expensive study. It's like, we're not going to get anything. He said, no, you will. I said, okay. So I, I believed him and I, you know, I read some articles. I said, okay, let's, let's see. So then we had the BMP only, 100, less than 100 micrograms. Then we did the lasagna versus sandwich. Okay, so <laughs> right. most people like the lasagna more right. than sandwich. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it seems like the BMP always has this. I mean, we've had hot dogs, That's sandwich, right. I mean, sausages. Sausages. Yeah, exactly. With, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so, but basically, so there's the defect, yep. huge defect. You put a little bit of graft material, put the BMP in there, more graft material, close. The other one, graft material only. And a little layer of BMP on the mm -hmm. top, like... Mm -hmm. It was amazing how much of a difference. Mm. Because of the mesenchymal cells yeah. that we the, see in so the soft the tissue. the location yeah. of the BMP yeah. makes yeah. that much difference. Yeah. And the, uh, the, the, the sandwich was very interesting. Above the membrane, in between the periosteal membrane, there was like lamellar bone. Mm. Mm. Inside the bone graft, there was big holes. Huh. There were big holes and like voids of bone formation. Right. The other one, the lasagna was, even though there was nothing inside the bone graft, only on the top, it was all bone down there. Wow. That's, and that's a huge, that's a huge study because yeah. that makes a big difference in the technique yeah. and I timing. think it's going to make a lot of changes. And you say eight weeks is what, you, is yeah. what that was looking at. Yeah, but at. that was, you know, in a, in a preclinical level, which is always like, you know, these, these um, <clears throat> preclinical study objects that are always faster healing than yes. human. But I would say um, for an extreme defect in the posterior mandible, if you do a lasagna, you can make your surgery I mean, your healing time less, mm -hmm. and you're gonna get bone very early on, like mm. like this table. Wow! Uh, so how? So talk about the timing on that. How long would you advocate healing a reentry for a case like that? Okay, so an average vertical defect we used to wait for nine months. Let's say seven. If you do the lasagna, I mean six the most. Wow! If you do, but the, the extreme defect is the one that is interesting because there is not a single article on the extreme defect, which is mm. the huge defect, and um, and that usually was taking like we put in the membrane, then uh, we wait, then we remove the membrane, then we wait more, then we put in the implant, then we do something called a mini sausage. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> yes. 
And then uh, but with this one, you do the lasagna, I would say in seven, eight months in a defect that is unheard of. Okay. It's done. Maybe six. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, I, I don't want to, I, I want to be a little bit more conservative with the, with the numbers, but I would say, uh, yeah, so you can make it better, faster. Hmm. Less swelling, less expense. <clears throat> Wow, your practice has definitely maybe changed a little bit over the your, the years. I think you know as we're seeing less edentulous, fully edentulous patients, and more partially edentulous patients, the the challenge might be greater now because people want more fixed restoration mm -hmm. than removable restoration. Oh, yeah. And has that happened in your practice as you've moved through your career? Yeah. So uh, I mean, honestly, uh. Removables, it's like non-existent. Yeah, yeah, and 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 we talk, as we were talking to Bach as well. I mean, he was saying that you know there's really not a lot of defects at this point that we don't feel good about being able to reconstruct, uh, even in the anterior maxilla. I mean, yeah. the pink porcelain just doesn't necessarily have to be a thing. And you feel the same way? Do you feel like yeah. there are very few limitations now with what we have? Yeah, but I think also talking about edentious patients. So, for example, I have a resolved maxillary patient. And I'm going to grab, but I'm not going to, I don't need to grab the whole face. Sure. Up, you know, mm -hmm. just like graft enough so I can put in implants. And today, the technology and the, the, the techniques for pink ceramics improve so much that you can have, like, yes. like you cannot tell that it's like, right. is it fake? Right, right, exactly, exactly. That's allowed for a lot, so, a yeah. lot less invasive grafting because we can make up the difference with the pink. So I think if you look at the best interest of patient, maybe some patients are completely okay and it's fine to do pink ceramic restorations. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, Wes, wow. I, think, I think this has been really enlightening because we are, when we learn, when we hear that something that used to be considered one of the hardest things is now actually one of the easiest things. <laughs> that, that makes us sleep better at night, I think. Is it easy? Uh, well, I mean, I, mean, I think if you have the right you're training. You're talking to the master, right? <laughs> if you have the right I mean, training, that's the You have the, the right training, and I think that if you're looking for more training, then you need to look to the experts, look to people like the AO, right, yep. who are going to publish yeah. articles yeah. that I'm sure you're going to yeah. to submit. And uh, we're super excited to read those yeah. and follow up. So yeah. thank you so much for being yeah. on Thanks today. Thanks for being on with us. Really, really, really appreciate, appreciate what you're thank doing. You. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Excellent.